of Washington. The problems that we're facing around the information environment are not unlike climate change uh, in that uh, it took us many, many years to get into this problem and it will probably take us decades to get out. There is no one solution that will fix it. Welcome to the Tech Policy Leaders Podcast. The world's most influential voices keeping you safe and informed online. Streaming from Washington, D.C., America's tech law and policy epicenter. These are your leaders. This is the podcast. Tech Policy Leaders with Joe Miller, founder and CEO of Washington. Washington, safe and informed since 2014. My guest today is Ryan Merkley, Managing Director of Aspen Digital. First joined the uh, Aspen Institute as Director of the Commission on Information Disorder which released its report in November 2021. Prior to joining Aspen, he was most recently chief of staff at the Wikimedia Foundation, focusing on operations and strategy, including the organization's defense and response to disinformation. Ryan Merkley. Ryan, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So it's been uh, several months since uh, Aspen released uh, your digital disorder report, which not a lot of folks have or a lot of folks have seen, but perhaps people outside of our policy circles who either aren't in our in our circles by choice or or uh, just because they're not privy to uh, some of the great information uh, you all provided in this report. So tell us a, a bit about you. What what led you to Aspen, and and what was sort of the catalyst for for you when you decided to work in this area of, of law and policy. So I joined the Aspen Institute uh, a little over a year ago. Uh, I've spent most of my career at the sort of the intersection of technology and the public good. Um, I started working uh, in municipal government uh, in uh, the mayor's office uh, at the city of Toronto, and I worked on civic tech issues, um, things like uh, you know, Toronto's open data project, uh, and you know the integration with uh, 311, so a single number call center for um, you know solving municipal problems. Um, so in in that environment, that's sort of how I came to uh, to these issues. Um, and through it was through civic tech and and civic open data uh, that I found my way into the sort of nonprofit tech space. I spent the last decade working. Uh, in technology nonprofits that advocate for a more equitable, accessible, and collaborative internet. Uh, I was at Mozilla, the folks who make Firefox. Um, I spent uh, five years as CEO uh, of Creative Commons, who make the CC licenses, which are used to share content online uh, in an open and accessible way uh, so that others can reuse them. Uh, and then uh, prior to joining Aspen, I was chief of staff uh, at Wikipedia with the uh, Wikimedia Foundation, uh, which is the nonprofit that uh, stewards uh, Wikipedia. One of the files that I worked on uh, while I was at Wikipedia uh, was the organization's defense uh, and response to disinformation in the lead up to the U.S. 2020 election. Uh, and so that meant working deeply with uh, our communities uh, around prepping for that uh, upcoming election, which everyone knew was going to be a contested election. Um, and looking at ways in which the organization could uh, ensure that disinformation um, did not spread on the platform. Um, and, you know, that's always an issue. I mean, I, I sometimes joke that, you know, Wikimedia has been in the, uh, the business of, uh, of stopping disinformation for 20 years. It's really what, uh, what it's all about. It's a, a platform where communities come together to identify what is reliable as fact and to share it. Um, and so, you know, that's the business they're in, but we knew this was going to be a tough one. Um, and after I finished that work, you know, I was really moved by how difficult and important that work was. Um, and I had heard that, uh, the Aspen Institute had raised some funds, uh, from, uh, Craig Newmark in order to do work around disinformation and a commission on that topic. And so I reached out to Vivian Schiller, who's our executive director, uh, at Aspen, uh, and asked if they had someone to do that work, uh, and they did not, uh, and it turned out it was a good fit. And so I joined as the first director uh, of the Commission on Information Disorder, and after we completed that work, they asked me to stick around as managing director. And so I've, I've been doing that work now for a little over a year. Uh, it's been great. Give us a sense for what this is about, you know, what the issues are here. 
um, especially about the discourse and, uh, you know, how much things have changed over the last few days, uh, given the Roe v. Wade decision. Uh, and these uh, these uh, issues are even, even more important than they were uh, back in uh, November. So kind of let's start there. Let's hear from your uh, perspective what's happening here and uh, some of the recommendations that this uh, this report tries to address. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to, to start there. Uh, so the Aspen Institute uh, struck a commission on information disorder last year. Uh, the commission had uh, 16 uh, individuals from sort of across the political spectrum and uh, a really diverse set of backgrounds, everything from, you know, security experts uh, to people who study algorithms and their role uh, in um, uh, in equity and technology to civil rights activists, to the former head of CISA uh, responsible for the security of the U.S. election, uh, to journalists, et cetera. Uh, and so that group came together and spent six months trying to grapple with this problem of what we called information disorder. It's a term that we borrowed from Claire Wardle, who's uh, a researcher um, at uh, First Draft Media. And really what it does is it thinks about disinformation, so intentionally spreading uh, false narratives uh, for some uh, some purpose, and misinformation, this sort of unintentional spread of these narratives. Um, and it takes it kind of up a level. And so information disorder looks at the whole information ecosystem that creates the conditions that allow for disinformation and misinformation to flourish. Uh, And so really it's a report about that. In the fall of last year, the commission published its findings uh, and its recommendations. And there were 15 recommendations. I won't take you all the way through them, but I will say that they were presented in sort of three broad buckets. One around transparency and looking at uh, and primarily focusing on legislation or regulations that would compel Uh, technology platforms to create more disclosure about how they operate and about what is happening on their platforms, because we don't know enough about how that all works, uh, how uh, those platforms are affecting us as individuals, but also as communities and, you know, where that content is going, who's being targeted, who has the highest reach and, and how is that influencing what is happening in our kind of information discourse? So that's part one. Part two was about building trust. And that really took it up a level above the sort of platform level and looked at the information environment and the ways in which we're relating to each other. So it talked about things like healthy discourse and polarization, um, the role of uh, diversity uh, in influencing the design of products, uh, local media investment and the decline of local media and the way that that really undermines the sort of foundational truth uh, of uh, reporting that we that we rely on in order to have our discussions um, and the sort of underlying cracks in our society that are capitalized on by disinformation campaigns like uh, America's complicated uh, history and current state uh, with race uh, and the issues that uh, are associated with that, which are often used as a wedge to drive communities apart. And then the third part of the report made recommendations around harms. Um, The commission knew that it would be impossible and probably undesirable in a a free speech environment to try to stamp out all misinformation. Um, What you really want to do is look at the sort of worst harms uh, and the worst actors and say, what can you do uh, to add friction for those bad actors or to discourage them uh, through policies or norms or other interventions? Um, And uh, what are some of the worst outcomes that we want to avoid, like undermining faith in our democracy or preventing people from seeking uh, important health interventions like vaccines. Um, And so, you know, what are the ways in which we can look at uh, intervening there? Uh, And so they looked at things like super spreaders, uh, media literacy, um, you know, a a sort of coordinated uh, federal approach so that it's clear what role the federal government has in this space and what role it does not have in this space in order to protect First Amendment rights and the government to not be the arbiter of truth uh, on the internet. Um, so that's a sort of high level view uh, of, of where the commission ended up. Um, and then since then, to answer your question, uh, you know, we've been doing exactly as you suggested. We've been talking to everybody who's willing to listen about this report. Uh, it's had a really good reception. 
Um, but as with all these kinds of reports, uh, there are so many of them uh, and it's hard to break through. And so we've briefed members of Congress. We've spoken with the administration. We've met with corporate leaders. We've spoken with the media. Uh, we've done a lot of this kind of uh, ongoing discussion and engagement to see what it will take to bring some of these recommendations to life. So tell us about the uh, corporations piece. You, you said you've spoken to corporations. And, and one of the, the challenges we're having here in the uh, civil rights and social justice community uh, here in Washington is that the way Washington works is that you get a lot of these companies seek to generate uh, support for their initiatives um, and address needs of, of equity and inclusion um, in this space. Google being a prime example of one of the first companies to move on including uh, diverse voices and tech policy debates. How how would how do you think about balancing the ethics of that and how organizations like ours that are sort of constrained by the way uh, Washington works uh, and kind of navigating this place where we need to educate the public about what's happening with credibility, uh, but at the same time, uh, you know, a lot of these companies are kind of really under the the uh, microscope now and really coming a lot uh, under a lot of scrutiny and so when we talk about trust how do you how do you think about those issues when when we have an organization like washington tech or other uh, organizations across the country when they're uh, seeking to find ways to uh, to engage in this conversation when um, you know membership support and foundation support can be can be sparse it's an incredibly complex information uh, environment. And, you know, one of the things that, uh, you know, one of the things that we think about uh, is, you know, how to approach the discussion about corporations in this conversation. So there's, there's a couple of different pieces here. There's uh, corporations more broadly and the role of corporate leaders in the discussion around information disorder. Um, and so that goes well beyond just technology. Uh, companies. In the report, uh, we talk about uh, disinformation as a tactic that is increasingly used against companies. And we saw that in the 2020 election, uh, the targeting of companies making voting machines. Um, and we saw it during COVID with the targeting of the companies making the vaccines uh, and looking for ways in order uh, to discredit uh, those companies. And we've seen real, you know, meaningful impacts there. So there's there's a piece there that is about that. There's a second piece, which is about the technology companies. And I think one of the things that gets often lost in the nuance of this debate around regulating technology companies is, and forgive me, this is obvious, but they're not all the same. Uh, and in that the services that they provide and the ways in which they engage with the public are very different. And so the experience of an Amazon user uh, who is, you know, looking to purchase things, but also reading the comments and the, and in the editorial there has one experience of user generated content. Uh, then you have things like search, uh, whether it's Bing or Google search or ya Yahoo or Yandex or whatever. Um, and then you have social media. Um, and even within social media and the user generated content space, they're all very different. Uh, and so you'll have great debates over, you know, the, you know, the algorithm that determines what is presented to you and the feed. Uh, and, you know, some solutions might work in one context, but not work in another. So perhaps a, you know, a chronological feed that was unedited might work for Twitter, but that would absolutely not work for YouTube. Um, you, you would be an unusable platform if you just saw every video that was posted on YouTube in order as they were presented. You need something on the back end that gives you what you're looking for. Um, that may not be true in other environments. And so all of that is to say the regulatory and uh, engagement context with platforms, uh, and I, I don't even necessarily know what platforms means anymore, but with technology companies engaging users is complicated because one solution won't fit all of them. One of the ways we uh, tried to give sort of additional life to the report was by um, hosting a um, a competition uh, where we invited um, individuals and, and organizations to uh, pitch an idea or a proposal uh, that would address the issue of information disorder. 
Um, and so um, we invited them uh, to uh, make their proposal. Uh, they were given a small award uh, as a finalist uh, and then competed uh, for a $75,000 award in order to build a prototype. Um, and it was really exciting uh, to see a real, really a wide range of proposals. It was really exciting uh, to see the uh, ideas that came forward as people grabbed onto different parts of the report. And so we saw proposals around everything from media literacy uh, to addressing issues of uh, transparency uh, to exploring, uh, you know, how to make it easier to search uh, through uh, video. Uh, and in the end, uh, the winning um, uh, the winning proposal was from a group that were uh, building actually a game for young people to make uh, you know, understanding and learning about disinformation uh, something that they could um, you know explore in a way that was more fun and engaging uh, in hopes of kind of arming them with some of the the tools that they might need uh, in a, an increasingly complex information environment. Um, so it was a uh, I think one one tactic uh, to kind of bring the report to life. Uh, and to give a chance for for some of this work to continue, so we were excited to do that. We did that with the Aspen Tech Policy Hub, uh, who were part of that, uh, who led that that work in their uh, a program within Aspen Digital. Yes, uh, Betsy Cooper has been on the show. She's uh, she's quite a force. She is. Yeah, she's my colleague. She's great. Tell us how things have changed in your view since. Um uh, since you released this report, have there been improvements in, in the way <laughs> I, I don't see any improvements, but perhaps you do. Uh, but it, are there improvements in how some of the platforms are, are, are dealing with some of the scrutiny that's been happening and the issues that you raised in this report or that the commission raised in this report? So the question of whether there've been improvements is, I feel like is a tough one. Um, uh, you know, the, there are things that I've seen that are encouraging. And of course, the, the environment that we're in has become increasingly divided and polarizing. Um, and so I think there's cause to be concerned and there's cause for hope. Uh, you know, last week um, I was in uh, Europe for a series of meetings that we were conducting uh, with leaders across sectors uh, to have this sort of same kind of conversation in a European and a UK context. Um, and at that time, we were talking a lot about European regulation. Um, and it's a very different regulatory environment. Um, both uh, the, uh, obviously, sort of the rule set under which the platforms operate, but also the willingness of the European Commission uh, to impose regulation uh, and fines on the platforms is very different. Uh, and so, you know, we were there doing meetings in the context of, uh, the DSA having been released. So a new set of European regulation, um, that will, uh, make a pretty significant impact on the transparency side of the equation. Um, and will force the platforms to disclose more about what they do. Um, and so when we look at our transparency recommendations and we look at what's in the DSA, there's a lot there to be encouraged by. Um, it also will take a long time for this to play out. The way that it works in the in Europe is that the commission issues its directive when the text is published, then each member state has a period of time to enact that directive in law. Um, and so that might take a, you know a year or so. Uh, before we see those laws enacted and then we see the results of those changes. So, you know, we, you have that. Uh, on the Thursday uh, when we were in Brussels, there was also uh, the signing of a new European code of practice on disinformation. Um, what's notable about this, and I won't go into the details of it, but what's notable is that all the platforms came to the table and negotiated an agreement on how they were going to operate around issues of disinformation and also agreed on how they would be held accountable for it. Um, we have not seen that kind of discussion in the US. We just don't have that level of engagement. We have a much more sort of lobbyist and um, protective relationship. And frankly, you know, the dynamic feels very much like the platforms have spent the last 25 years trying to convince Congress that they couldn't possibly understand technology well enough to regulate it. So best if they just didn't bother, um, lest they destroy, you know, 
25 years of unprecedented uh, prosperity from the internet. Um, and by and large, that plus a lot of lobbying money has left, I think, uh, a lot of paralysis in uh, the U.S. legislative context, uh, where we see a lot of bills, but none of them pass, um, and where uh, Congress doesn't agree on what it wants. Uh, and so while there seems to be consensus around uh, um, making changes to Section 230, there is no consensus amongst the parties about what they want to do with 230. In fact, if anything, the two parties want quite the opposite uh, on that. So that is, you know, quite discouraging. So you've got, you know, one, one end, you've got some regulatory things moving that probably will have a, a more global reach, even though it's EU legislation. In the US, you've got probably not much motion there um, happening. Um, and with an election just around the corner, probably the, the ability for changes to happen uh, in the US uh, pretty greatly diminished. Um, and then as, as you said at the top of this conversation, um, things becoming increasingly more polarized over a variety of issues. Um, and, you know, before this week, it would have been COVID or any number or the insurrection uh, and the hearings around that. And now we have, uh, you know, the fallout of Roe v. Wade, um, which are not, you know, on the, on their own disinformation issues, though there's disinformation surrounding all of these topics. Um, but it just speaks to the sort of the ways in which we don't have the tools to talk to each other uh, and to hear each other um, as communities. And so the, this division uh, and uh, inability to connect uh, is, you know, a real challenge. Yeah, it's extremely challenging. Very different from... Uh, the way I grew up, which was extremely, extremely diverse. I mean, we had folks, you know, across the racial and ethnic uh, spectrum on the Upper West Side, of, you know, across the, the socioeconomic spectrum. And uh, but the national debate is so much different because we have all of the segregation uh, going on and we had such a, a high concentration of, of folks living in in segregated suburbs. And of course, New York City has its own segregation um, issues, uh, mm -hmm. which add a layer of complexity. So it def definitely wasn't um, a utopia, uh, but certainly folks uh, across the spectrum uh, were were engaging, uh, perhaps not as much across the political uh, spectrum, but certainly across the socioeconomic and, and racial and ethnic spectrum. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of debate over, you know, the historical context of, you know, are we more polarized or are we not? Um, and I, and increasingly, and I think compelled by some conversations I had with our one of our co-chairs, uh, Rashad Robinson, who's a, a civil rights activist, you know, he would often say there are no good old days to go back to. Um, and that for lots of folks, there never were. There never was trust. And for lots of folks, there never were those good times to go back to, uh, which is, I think, in part, you know, what you were saying. Um, and so I, I think it's helpful to have historical context, but I think it's also sometimes helpful to just say there is polarization. We are divided. There's no debate over whether we are divided today or not. Are we more or less? I don't know. Um, but I know that we're not talking to each other and we're not talking to each other well. That, that feels indisputable. Um, and I know that the platforms and the technologies that we use in order to engage with each other online feel like they're not helping uh, in the ways that I wish they could. Uh, and, you know, I think we all hoped at the opening, uh, you know, at the sort of dawn of the internet that the, that this would bring us together. Uh, and to be fair, in lots of ways it has. Um, and, you know, it's, the internet has been a profound way of connecting uh, and has resulted in a lot of good, but it is also resulting in a lot of bad. And I think we haven't figured out how to rec reconcile that. No one wants to lose the great things that the internet has helped us create as society. I think we also are really feeling the pain of the ills that are, um, that we're facing and the ways that some have used these tools to exploit others, uh, and to divide us against ourselves. Um, and so I, I just, you know, it's a, it's all going to be about trade-offs. Uh, there's not going to be a, you know, 
a single law that we pass that solves this problem. That doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. We all know that. Um, and so we need to have a space to have healthy discourse about those trade-offs so that we can talk about what we want as communities and build what we need in order to engage each other as humans uh, and, and to have a healthy society. kids safety on the internet we are here to help watching tech's five-step checklist will take you through the process of protecting your kids and we'll give you tips on how to set up the best parental controls for your children on their devices you want what's best for your children they deserve to be safe online our step-by-step guide will help you make sure they are download watching tech's online safety checklist today to protect your kids online find it at protectyourkids.online that's protectyourkids.online you're plugged into the Washing Tech Tech Policy Podcast, the inclusive voice of tech policy. To some extent, it's 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 magnified by you know media mm-hmm. and uh, you know our traditional media. Even though I saw a report recently that only one percent of folks uh, even watch things like Fox News or or MSNBC. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I live currently in Fairfax. Uh, Virginia, mm-hmm. which was sort of the epicenter of the Civil War. I mean, we have the Manassas Battlefield here. We have a uh, main thoroughfare still named the, the Lee Jackson Memorial Highway. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the demographics have changed so much. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this is a, a, a blue area. Yeah. And so these, there are these constant reminders of what uh, could happen if, if God forbid, uh, there's another uh, Civil War. You know, one of the things that that I thought was important about the commission's recommendations was the way it focused in on the value of local media. And, you know, a lot of these debates rightly focus in on Fox News and uh, right wing talk media and the sort of extended podcast network that's part of that as well um, and focus on that. But the flip side of that and, and in some ways the antidote to some of that is the importance of local media that is connected to its communities. And in the U S we've really seen the decline of that. Margaret Sullivan has written a lot about this and as, as of others. Um, and we heard from the journalists on the commission, Katie Couric and Amanda Zamora about this topic. And, you know, one of the things we know is that people are more likely to believe reporting that comes from a trusted local source, you know, a reporter in your neighborhood, Someone who lives in your community is ideally of your community and looks like your community uh, that, uh, you know, can speak to that, that experience. That's the best kind of reporting. It's also the kind of stickiest in, in the sense that the things that communities read from their local reporters, they're more likely to trust. And we're losing that or have lost that uh, as a result of, you know, the, the breaking of the business model, which the platforms uh, contributed to greatly, especially um, Google advertising and Facebook, um, which, you know, kind of hollowed out a lot of the advertising that those um, outlets relied on. Um, but also, uh, you know, media consolidation uh, has undermined those. And so there's a real loss there of good local reporting. Uh, and one of the things we've we've learned is that that's actually true around the world. Um, that's true in Romania and in Germany and in London. Uh, and so, you know, that that's a foundational part of a healthy democracy is good local reporting. It's a thing that we build everything else on top of. And so one of the things I thought was interesting about this commission report is that it looked at much more of an ecosystem view. It's not just the platforms. It is the platforms, but it's not just the platforms. There are other issues 
uh, that we need to contend with if we want to solve this problem together. Yeah, I mean, the Telecommunications Act of 1996 basically destroyed uh, any any type of hope of of local uh, media uh, being able to survive. Uh, and that includes newspapers uh, because they're all competing for for uh, you know reader the same consumer time. Uh, there's, everyone has a limited number of hours in the day, so either they're going to read the paper or watch TV. Uh, but the other issue was the 1969 Public Media Act, which which basically gave you know corporation for public broadcasting a monopoly. And we, you know, from our perspective at Washington Tech, I'm not sh- so sure that um, that model uh, works uh, anymore. Uh, you know, there's nothing preventing the local podcasts from 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 popping up or, or local uh, public media networks uh, that can be supported. But if, but the federal government won't support those because they're limited by this 1969 act. And so this plays into what I mentioned before around this kind of this lack of funding, uh, you know, to get these things underway, because if you have a local podcast and your audience is going to be local. Uh, and so how do you sell that to um, advertisers um, outside of areas that are heavily populated like Fairfax County yeah. or New York County or, you know, uh, places like that where they can get local businesses to, to support those outlets through underwriting. Yeah, the, you know, the, there's a, a long tradition and a, and a international tradition of, you know, public, uh, public media. Uh, you know, I'm from Canada where the, you know, um, public media, the CBC or the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation is one of the only entities that is still doing, you know, in community radio reporting in lots of places. And so um, I can see the value of it. I also completely see how it's big, be- become fraught and how there's, you know, in an environment of limited funding, it can feel like that trade-off is not the right one. Uh, and so folks are, are struggling there. Um, in the commission's report, it talks about uh, the uh, a bill that had been put forward around journalism sustainability that would allow uh, people to allocate, um, you know, funds towards local journalism initiatives. And there's a, so a way in order to get money into the hands of good local news outlets uh, that uh, avoids the kind of challenges of uh, the government making those choices. Because obviously, you know, when we want a free and independent press, um, who uh, she who holds the purse strings uh, can have an enormous amount of influence over what gets covered or doesn't. Uh, and so we want to maintain that independence. Uh, and so as with all things, you know, it's trade-offs. Um, but you're absolutely right that there's an, you know, there are real business model issues for the media that have to be addressed in order to have sustainable local journalism. What's some advice you have for folks entering this space? What are some final ideas you'd like to leave with us before we close? And where can we find you online? This is a really complicated topic. Um, it's the problems that we're facing around the information environment are not unlike climate change uh, in that uh, it took us many, many years to get into this problem, and it will probably take us decades to get out. There is no one solution that will fix it. Uh, And so, you know, breaking up the monopolies may help, but it won't fix it. Uh, Reforming Section 230 may make a difference, but it won't fix it. Um, Solving the problem of local news will help, but it won't fix it. Um, It's going to take many interventions Uh, And each one of them will probably have trade-offs because we have values that underpin the work that we're trying to do. And some of those values will be at odds. So if we don't want people to lie, um, we will always be up against our belief in free speech and the importance of ensuring that every person can speak. Um, And those tensions and trade-offs are difficult. Uh, and so my advice to folks is, you know, acknowledge that, know that these are not easy issues and that they require, you know, informed debate and deliberation, um, and that there is no silver bullet. Um, and anyone that says otherwise is selling you something. Um, and that, you know, the way that we get out of this is by working together and by working through what are really complex issues of actually community and society. I mean, at the Yes, there are technologies underpinning all of these, but at the bottom of all of this 
It's about how we relate to each other, how we disagree and debate over a set of agreed facts uh, and how we build a healthy society. Uh, and that's really the hardest work of all. And uh, that's the work that we really have to do together. You can find our work at the aspeninstitute.org. And I'm on Twitter at Ryan Merkley. Ryan Merkley, Managing Director of Aspen Digital. Ryan, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me.